there's so much bad religion out there that is really not intending to help us with our profound humanness, but it's intending to help us with uh, escaping from our profound humanness into some kind of uh, comforting foolishness. Uh, and uh, that kind of religion is a perversion. But it doesn't mean because there's so many perversions of religion out there that religion is not an important part of human life. I mean, you, you wouldn't give up economics just because you got poor economics, would you? I mean, you know, we, we've got to have economics. We've got to access resources and produce them into something useful and distribute the useful things of services and goods. Uh, that's an essential part of society. Well, religion is just like that. It's an essential part of society. So it's important to have good religion that helps you access your profound humanness rather than the bad religion we have that helps you escape your profound humanness. Uh, so reforming religion or making a new religion that uh, does the job uh, of helping people be more accident prone to their humanness is a very important thing. And so it's, it's worth your life, if you want it to be worth your life, to give your time to practicing, not only for yourself, but building practices that work for other people and reforming uh, the obsolete practices that uh, characterize our planet. Uh, so if any of you want a religious vocation, there's, it's just as honorable uh, as uh, becoming a lawyer uh, or a physician or a nurse or a teacher or anything else. Today is just that religious formation is the basic pole of culture, which is the being pole of society, which is always going on for humans who are very social beings. Uh, now that's a controversial topic for some people. Uh, Marx wanted to make economics the, the foundational thing. But for me, believe it or not, religion is the foundational thing. It's at the bottom of it all. It gives meaning to the whole cultural realm, and the whole cultural realm gives meaning to the economic realm and the political realm. And so the revolution in religion is primary to making society change, because everything that happens in religion affects every other process in society uh, one way or the other. Very bad religion helps filter up into a very bad society, and very good religion opens up all kinds of possibilities for a very good society. Religion always manifests in some kind of ethics, which is intentionalizing the fact that religion influences everything. Out of your access of your profound humanness, everything changes. Your view of, of economics, and your view of politics, and your view of cultural building, education, everything shifts uh, when you're operating out of your profound humanness rather than out of your illusions. Uh, so this is figuring out your ethics uh, from that basis is a part of the theoretics of a religion. Well, this brings me to the next paradox that we need to understand to rebuild religion. And that is that the rebuilding religion starts with accessing your profound humanness and giving form to it. Uh, now, the forms you give to it are never going to hold it, but you have to give form to it in order to, in order to practice it, in order to have it, in order to continue living it. So the uh, the institutionalization of what we point to with accessing profound humanness takes place. The religion doesn't just include having top door experiences. It includes giving those top door experiences a whole organization, uh, a religious organization, an institutionalization, if you like. Now. In our day, institutionalizing is offensive to people. It's offensive to us because we've met so many institutions that were not, not functioning well. But if you don't have economic institutions, you don't have an economy. These essential economic processes are just there in the universal structure of society, but they have to be institutionalized. And this society institutionalizes one way, and this society institutionalizes another way. But without institutions, you don't carry out the the primal function. This is true of religion. The primal function is to access your profound humanness. But this cannot be done without institutions. And that's very offensive to you and you and you and you and you and me. <laughs> because we don't have a positive view of institutions. 
We hate institutions. We hate them because we've had so many bad ones that have injured us. But the English language is an institution. What would we do without it? It's an institution. That's what we mean by institution, is something works for us. Communication is the, is the need, but you have to have a language if you're going to talk to each other. So the language or structure of English, can, or some other language, is an institution. And art is all an institution. Uh, art is a big business for paintings, and a big business for music, and a big business for so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. Architecture takes tremendous institutionalization to build great cathedrals or tall buildings or whatever or architecture of great energy you're going to create. So without institutionalization, none of these essential social processes are actually carried out in history. So you're just thinking, you're not doing without building institutions. If you're going to do something, you have to build an institution that does it. Now that's an unfriendly insight to many people because they want to live in their minds and not in history. Uh, if you're going to live in history, you're going to build institutions or correct the institutions you've got uh, in some way or another, or you're just playing games, you see. So that's, that's, that's an insight we have to grasp to ever be interested in renewing our religions or in creating a new religion that we like better. We, we're not going to have a new religion without institutionalizing it. The reason why institutionalization is an important idea to figure out what word you use for it is that you think about Islam. Islam institutionalized after the Muhammad heartfelt revolution struck fire in lots of people. What do we do? We bow five times a day toward Mecca uh, to remind ourselves that there's just one God. <laughs> we just do that. So here you have this movement through generations of history because it was institutionalized. Uh, and we have Christianity because it was institutionalized. If, I mean, Jesus institutionalized a little bit. And Paul institutionalized God much more. By the time you get to Augustine, you're doing civilization-wide institutionalization with the political system and the king and the rich people giving money to the institutionalization further to take this message to the last village of the world. <laughs> and we sent these nuns and monks and priests out there to bring the gospel to people who had never heard it and so forth. So an entire civilization was in some measure healed as well as perverted and later, later so into various kinds of problems. But this was always reformed. This monastery came into being to reform Christianity. Luther tore down half of the Christian heritage at that time, the popes and six, five of the seven sacraments and so forth, and built a new Christianity, <laughs> a new institutionalization, which we call Protestantism. This is what the history of religion is like and going to be like always. Uh, there's always this tension between the, the spiritual access of our profound humanness and giving it some kind of form, giving it some kind of social movement, some kind of social history, some kind of permanence in life that can pass on my little discovery, profound humanness, to thousands and thousands of other people through generations and generations and generations. generations. Uh, so we're just talking revolution here, and whether you're talking about race or feminism or Christian religion, you're going to face this paradox, this tension between finding the depth of it in your own soul and then trying to give it form, knowing that the forms you give it are never going to do the job and they're going to pervert and they're going to have to be reformed. Uh, and that's sort of anguishing, but uh, that's the way it is. That's the way it's always going to be. Uh, and so we need to get busy, in my view, <laughs> and build some new institutions for Christianity, if that's our love, or build some new institutions for Buddhism, if that's our love, or if a new religion is needed, you're going to have to build institutions for it. That's the thing I want to talk about, the idea of creating religion or recreating religion. And uh, this is an old thing that's taken in Christianity. Jesus created. I mean, he was a creative Jew. He was an utterly loyal Jew, but he was very creative in bringing the, the radicality 
in Judaism up to date in his particular Galilean communities. And Paul, Paul did a revolution on that, expanding religion out into the Mediterranean world, taking Gentiles who were hanging on to the edge of the uh, synagogues into the mix, which was really trouble for the Jews that were already in the mix, uh, who thought they ought to be circumcised, as you remember. And, and Paul just stood by, no, uh, the Holy Spirit is interviewing, entering uncircumcised people just as men as well as circumcised ones, and we don't want to require that. And they had a, almost a war over that. At any rate, this revolution in religion has been there from the beginning, and Augustine and Christianity, and Thomas Aquinas and Christianity, and Luther and Christianity, and my favorite man, Kierkegaard and Christianity, all were religious revolutionaries in the Christian context. And this story can be told in Buddhism, Hinduism. Buddhism is a strange, strange, strange religion. It, it has gone everywhere, and everywhere it's gone, it just sort of absorbed the culture it went into and created a new Buddhism. Uh, it's, it's as evangelistic as Christianity. Uh, those two religions have just, just spread like fever from the very beginning and have spread into every culture on the planet. You're going to do something by organizing something to make that teaching possible, and that is going to bring you into this paradox that whatever name you give it, institutions are a part of human life from which there is no escape. And religion is, the process of religion is in no different from the process of sewage disposal. If you want sewage disposed, you have to create an institution for it. If you want profound humanness to be accessed by the majority or abundance of people, you're going to have to organize something to get that done. And the organization's already there going on, so it may be that simply reforming organizations you already have is a better option in some cases. I think right now, I'm not interested in reforming the Methodist Church anymore. I don't think the Methodist Church can be reformed. I think it's too sick to be informed. I think the spirituality I'm trying to share with you this morning is not going to fit into the old wineskin of Methodism. I'm having to build a new expression of Christianity that is very different from Methodism <laughs> in order to express my experience of profound humanness adequately or more adequately. Recognizing that what I'm going to build with my little circles and, and their meeting together and their studying Kierkegaard or whatever they do um, is not the final answer because there are no final answers in historical life. But that has to be done in some manner by somebody. If 20 years from now, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, somebody's going to remember Jesus and his revolution in, in accessing profound humanness. Uh, we wouldn't even know of him if it hadn't been institutionalized and passed on down to us. The United States of America is a great institutionalization. I mean, the, the original ideas of the, the equality of all the people and the right to get more people voting and so forth in making the great common decisions was a deeply revolutionary thing uh, that set aside the king. Even though we have kingly presidents, we set aside the king. And even though we didn't let women and black people vote for a while, uh, we were starting a revolution. Uh, but now that United States Revolution has beginning to drop through the donut, in my view, in terms of its foreign relations and its internal care for the poor, and you could name 16 other things. Uh, and so we have to repair or re reinstitutionalize the United States of America into forms of better justice than we have. And this is what you read about in the Bible, isn't it? When Amos comes upon the scene, he's radically out to reinstitutionalize the whole of Israel. And so was Isaiah and 2nd Isaiah and 3rd Isaiah and 14th Isaiah. They were all out to revolutionize uh, the people of God to get them back to what it was like to leave bondage and be free. And, and this is the whole story. Jesus was a similar kind of thing. He was a Jew to the end of his days, but he appointed 12, or maybe he didn't, but they thought he did. At any rate, they had 12, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, 
who are going to institutionalize a whole new Judaism uh, with new tribes, new understandings, new life. And Paul picked up that and did some more things with it and so on and so on down to us.